Uh, thanks very much. It's wonderful to be here. So how many of you have tried Brave? Yay, lots of you. Great, this is wonderful. So I'm, I'm here to tell you about oh, all sorts of things. Uh, so actually, uh, primarily these three things. So I'll tell you about the browser and why, in a sense, you need a new browser or you might need a new browser. I'll tell you about BAT, the basic attention token and why you might care about that. And lastly, I'll tell you about both our progress so far and about some of the things that are coming up. So this wonderful world that some people call Web 3.0, a web of value. I'll give you some hints about that. Arguably, most of us don't quite know what's coming just yet, but hopefully I'll provide some excitement for the, for the morning as well. So here's a glimpse of our vision. We are focusing on privacy. We want to provide a private by default browsing for, uh, for, uh, for, for the end user. Yeah, we, feel that, we feel quite strongly that the browsing that we have today is not something that we wanted in the first place. I'll tell you about all sorts of shenanigans with third parties. Did you hear about the British uh, Airways hack from uh, just about 24 hours ago? Yeah, do you know what was at fault there? I mean, do you know the culprit? Well, okay, we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So hold on to that thought. So, so the first goal clearly was not enough. So we have a second goal, which is we want to reform or disrupt digital advertising. The way advertising is done online, we want to do it differently. We want to do it in a way that's more effective and also in a way that's more privacy preserving as well. And I'll show you how we plan to do that. And as part of that, we have this uh, crazy idea, well, one of many really, which is that we want to compensate users for their attention. We want to pay users for their attention quite directly. So as you'll see, if users choose to opt in into our ad infrastructure or our ad ecosystem, we'll compensate them for their attention. How will we do that? We'll use our token to do so. And I'll uh, you know, start connecting these things in just a few minutes so that these ideas hopefully will take hold and uh, come together nicely. But before I do that, let's start here. So this is a website from a couple of months ago. This is before GDPR. Remember the days before GDPR? Yes, most of you were alive then, yeah, good. So this is The Economist, this is a typical news site, and as a typical news site, it has all sorts of third-party trackers. And if you use an extension like this one over here, uh, Ghostery, uh, it will tell you about how many trackers it's got. So in this case, there are about 30 different trackers that have to do with advertising, of course, which is one of the primary goals, but not only. There is analytics, there is site optimization, there is site personalization, and so on and so forth. So in a sense, together with the first party site, which is The Economist, the site that, the site that you want to interact with, there's a whole bunch of others that have come along for the ride, if you will. And it ends up to be a fairly significant violation of end user privacy because these trackers are not only on this site, they're all across the web. And why are they doing that? Well, it's largely clear, right? So one of the reasons for that is they want to build uh, profiles of the end user by observing how they travel from one site to the next to the next and so forth. And why would they want to do that? It's because they want to be able to create a behavioral profile to better able to, tar to, to, to better target ads at the end user. So ad targeting is one of the primary goals. Turns out that you don't actually have to do it this way to achieve similar results, and in fact, better results as well, as I'll hopefully show to you also. But this is the situation we have now, which is to say, Oftentimes, because of this ad tech, this is the collective term for what we just saw, yeah? things are a lot slower than they need to be. So on the mobile browser, on a relatively slow connection, you might see slowdowns of five times, five times slower than it needs to be. It's hugely invasive, so teamz.com tends to be like a poster child for not how, to, for how not to create websites. So for teamz.com, at one point, they had over 100 different trackers partying on that website. Yeah, so remember, like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a host and a bunch of parasites on the site, if you will. 
<laughs> and then, you know, of course, it can be quite ex expensive as well. So if you don't have a, if you have a metered connection, right, you are pay paying by the megabyte, for example, some estimates show that you could be okay with paying quite a lot more for this extra weight of ad tech that you did not ask for in the first place. And last but not least, uh, what's, uh, so, so this ad tech is also a gateway to what's called malwaretizing, which is a way to deliver malware and ransomware through the channels that are used by, by ads. So the situation is kind of dire, right? So the situation is not so pleasant, which is why we've seen the rise of ad blockers. So this is the last decade of ad blocker usage. So we see it being a fairly fringe phenomenon down here. And by now, this is about a year ago, we see, well, eh, almost close to half a billion people using ad blockers. So another show of hands, how many of you have tried an ad blocker? Okay, almost everybody actually, which is very typical, but not so. If you go outside, you'll see some exception to that rule. So it depends on the uh, country. So for example, in Germany, the usage is quite high, maybe 40% and more. In the UK, it's something like 25%. In some parts of Asia, it's actually over 50%. Depends on how polluted the web is in that particular place. So in the UK, actually, the web is not actually as polluted as it used to be. There is a different phenomenon that's raising its not so pretty head, which is this, right? Paywalls, have you seen these? Yeah? Frankly, just about any website, any news website, that is to say, that values its own content, has some sort of a paywall. And some of these things look like this, right? So this is. This is one of them, here's another, and here's another. And in some cases, it's what I call a nag wall. So the Guardian, for example, right, they try to encourage you to sign up, and they try to guilt you into this as well, right? They don't insist, but they ask nicely, and they keep asking nicely until I, you're like, oh, I just give up. Different approaches, you know, all sorts of psychological tricks, but like, what does this tell us? Well, so they want your money. Okay, so that's kind of obvious, right? But one other thing it tells us as well is that the ad approach that's been there for over a decade now, right? What we saw with The Economist, right? So basically banner ads at the top of the website and to the right of the content as well, sometimes at the bottom also. These things don't work so well. So for a typical banner ad, for a typical display ad, what do you think the click-through rates are? Any guesses? Like percentage points, yeah? Yes, sir, in the back. 5%. You're tremendously optimistic. I mean, you, sir, I envy your optimism. Please, somebody else. You. 1%, okay. Anybody? What, what? No, you have to raise your hand. You cannot play this game otherwise, please. Less of a thousand, well, you're slightly pessimistic. Okay, okay, so here's a pessimist in the audience. No, no, it's slightly better than that. Yes, anybody else? Anyone else? Yes, please. Huh? Half a percent, no, that's, that's a bit too high. So you actually, the pessimist in the audience, was closer to the right answer than anybody else. So if you look at the estimates, this is roughly what we see. So these are some of the uh, click to rate. So this is, uh, what is it? Eight one hundredth of one percent. This is for a typical ad out there on a fairly random web page, averaged. Of course, once we start doing targeting, yeah, we see numbers that are a lot better. So uh, for uh, like Twitter, for example, these click to rates go up quite significantly by almost to an order of magnitude. For Facebook, which is a very effective walled garden, these click to rates are significantly higher. Why? In part because they're better targeted, also in part because they're generally somewhat less annoying. Uh, if you want to read all about that, I recommend this book, Attention Merchants, that came out a little while back, but it's just as relevant today as it, as it was when it came out. Okay, so uh, 
Now let's talk about Brave, and this is just kind of a preview of coming attractions, but something we are proud of is our adoption curve. And you know, we are a small browser, but we are making strides. So this is from uh, August 27th, which is what, last week, the week before last, something like that. So we hit 10 million downloads on Android, uh, on Android right? So, you know, there are more and more people trying out the browser, and uh, I'll tell you why this is interesting uh, in the next several slides as well. And to do so, I need to switch gears slightly and tell you about the BAT or the basic attention token. So, the ecosystem is broken, and this is what I tried to explain in the preceding several slides in the previous several minutes, preceding several minutes. And uh, it goes back to this Bermuda Triangle of advertising, right? So there are three types of parties here. So there are users who are treated like a product, there are publishers, which is to say owners of websites that you go to, whose life is not so sweet anymore. Why? Because their revenue is going down, which is why they're resorting to things like paywalls. They cannot monetize very well. And then advertisers. And you would think that advertisers are doing spectacularly, but, uh, but the thing is that they're not, right? And part of the reason is because it's ad fraud. So ad fraud is a really huge problem in that space. So if they get a report that says, well, we just showed 10 million impressions, like how do they know that this is actually true? So ad fraud is a huge problem. There are some estimates there, yeah? So we're trying to address all of these problems at once because, well, I guess we try to be ambitious or something. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so I'll t I, talked, uh, I talked about some of these pain points. Let me skip this slide. I think there are a lot more details than I have the time to cover. But ultimately, our, what we attempt to do is we try to use a token in order to address these, uh, in these, these challenges, right? So uh, the token becomes a medium of exchange in that Bermuda Triangle of the user, publisher, and advertiser. So when it comes to the user, uh, we plan to use BAT to reward users for their attention. When it comes to publishers, publishers rece will receive BAT based on the amount of user attention. So and the revenue will increase, as it, says, as it says here, as inefficiencies go down. So this is an alternative way to monetize content, and this is what we have currently in the browser, and this is a system we've been running for about nine months, and we have thousands of publishers who have signed up by now. This is a way to fairly directly compensate publishers for the content they provide. This is a form of micropayments, if you will, and I'll explain uh, some of the details uh, in the next few slides as well. And lastly, advertisers. Turns out that there is a way to please these people as well. Why? It's because we are building a system that avoids ad fraud by design. It's also because we provide better targeting. So let's think about targeting because of something I mentioned before. So why are there all these third-party scripts tracking you all across the web? What are they trying to do? They're trying to understand what you like. So if you are a car enthusiast, for example, they want to learn that about you. Because you go to car-related sites, you, knew, you read news articles about cars, that sort of thing. Great. Turns out, that the, turns out the browser knows everything. The browser sees every interaction you have with the web out there. So the browser has a much more accurate model, a much more complete model of what you like and what you don't like as a long-term interest, as a short-term interest, in terms of search intent, in terms of purchase intent, that sort of thing. So the browser sees everything that there is to see, and as such can build a much more accurate user model that can be used for purposes such as personalization of content, or website content, or targeting of ads. Right? Remember the point I made about walled gardens like Facebook. The reason they can target ads there so well is because they know a lot more about you. It's simple. Okay. So a tiny bit more about the token. I don't want to dwell on that. We did an ICO, so that was the fastest ICO in history, June 1st, 2017. It's been a, a little bit over a year. Uh, raised that much money in 24 seconds, and that was that. And that's what enabled the project to function and grow, and we can hire people. We have over 70 people working on different parts of the browser in the BAT ecosystem now. 
And uh, as we, as you can read about on the website as well, so this project unfolds in three stages. The first stage, this is what the, 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 the Mercury stage, yeah? So we have been uh, running that. So we deployed this some months ago and been, we've been running that for a while now. This is the contributor stage. This is where you can put a little bit of cryptocurrency into br the browser and we give you a way to do so. On a monthly basis, for example, right? You put five pounds worth of cryptocurrency into the browser and that, that is spread across all the publishers that you visit. And I'll show you how that works. The next stage is where we have ads. We are planning to ship that in the upcoming several months. And of course, that's going to be exciting and scary at the same time. We'll see what happens. And the last stage is integration. So different interesting ways to integrate the browser and the website. And I'll give you several examples of that in the next several slides also. But one thing to think about is that, so suppose now, Pretty much all interesting content out there is paywalled, which is hugely annoying, isn't it? Because, well, now you have to figure out which uh, newspapers to sub sign up for, so maybe you're willing to pay for the FT, but like, how many of these subscriptions can you actually maintain? So what if, instead of that, you'd be able to pay bad to get access to these resources, but on a piecemeal basis? I might only want to read like three articles in the FT on a monthly basis. I don't want to sign up for the entire publication. It doesn't make any sense. So I'm willing to pay for what I spend, if you will, or for what I watch of you, but I wouldn't want to do it uh, by holding on to dozens of subscriptions. It doesn't make sense. There are other models here as well. So the model I like is that you earn, say, four bat by watching four ads during the day when you're at work maybe on a coffee break or something, yeah? And then you go home, and then you watch a movie by spending three bat. so now you have one left that you save for tomorrow to, to do something else with, yeah? So this is, a po this is a model where you can both earn the token and also redeem it within the same day. And that's quite a powerful model because it allows you to basically just enter this ecosystem by doing things that you would sort of do naturally, more or less, anyhow. So some screenshots from, uh, screenshots from the browser here. This is your typical, I mean, this looks slightly different. This is from a couple months ago. The UI keeps changing on us because uh, we have some wonderful designers who do that all the time. But this is your standard browser kind of configuration tab. And there's this payments thing over here that tells you how much your monthly budget is. It's not a lot, but it's just kind of, if you bat here, yeah? So this is what it is in bat, and this is what it is in US dollars, and we can show other currency as well. You can add some funds here as well. And this, uh, these are the publishers that I compensate. And here's another one that's similar to that, but clearly from somebody else. <laughs> and then here's another one of these as well, and there's another one also. And so here's my contributor statement, contribution statement for the month. So you can see that I spent a lot of time on this website and maybe these and the Wall Street Journal and so on and so forth and this is the percentage and so on and this is how much I've contributed. The point is that this data stays local to the end user. This data never leaves my machine. And this is a design principle that I highlighted in the beginning of doing this in a way that's privacy preserving, yeah? So we don't know what you browse, only you know what you browse. This is a statement for yourself if you're curious but that's where it stands, this is where it stays. How do we implement? So just to give you a glimpse of some of the gory details, we use a system called Anonize. This is based on a research project from back, back in 2016. We have collaborated with these people quite extensively over the last 18 months to build up a system that allows us to learn about the totals, if you will, right? So we know how much total attention from brave users the Wall Street Journal has received, and we can aggregate it and figure out how much to pay the Wall Street Journal at the end of the month. But we do not know who these views come from. No? An important design principle here. A little bit about uh, ads, and I don't want to dwell on this too much because the, the shape of these things keeps changing as we are getting closer and closer to actually releasing this. So maybe just like wait until the release and you'll see for yourselves. Um, but so a little bit about what we are thinking here about the ads, primarily over here on this side of things, user ads. 
Um, something as well from our designer, something called Brave Rewards and ideas around micro-tipping and things like that. So this is, you know, we'll see what, what of this actually makes into the final product. I don't want to make too many promises here. But the idea here is that, uh, yes, so there's that. Watch out for that product coming to a browser near you in the next couple of months. Uh, but the principles I've already explained, which is to say, if you watch an ad, and typically this would be some sort of a video kind of thing. So maybe there'll be 10 seconds of video, 20 or something like that. At the end of that, you'll be compensated uh, for having done so. Yeah, this uh, will be maintained within your wallet that's in the browser which is already quite a novel concept to many users, most users, in fact. And then you'll be able to use that uh, to uh, gain access to content or potentially other things as well. We're working on some other ideas in this space also. If you care about this, go to look at the timeline. And I wanted to uh, highlight some of these things here. It's actually more like 4 million monthly at this point heavily uh, uh, mobile-based over here. This is one of the reasons why we are putting a lot more attention now into optimizations of the browser, because these things operate on slower connections and less powerful devices as well. Super important to us. Uh, something else, this is actually 10. This is an old slide, so at this point at 10. Once we get to 20, I think we'll be you know, in a better shape still. Uh, over 4,000 by now, actually, websites that are Brave verified. There is a validation process, what's known as KYC, because we need to pay these publishers at the end of every month. So we need to know who, who they are. Uh, over 10,000 YouTube channels signed up. Why these YouTube channels? So Google has monetized a lot of YouTube creators. Within about a week of us announcing that we now support YouTube channels in Brave, we had over 10,000 channel creators sign up. So there's a lot of hunger for this kind of stuff. Why? Because they look for other ways to get paid for their content, because ads don't work for them, or they don't work for them particularly well. And this is how many subscribers these people have. OK, great. Um, some partnerships as well, I'm going to unfold that and kind of talk you through a couple of these things. So we have a focus on privacy, so we have a partnership. I don't think this is working. A partnership with DuckDuckGo over there. We have a focus on uh, crypto, so this is, we have, this is why we have MetaMask embedded in the browser, and we have had it some, for some time. And we have, I don't know, some colorful supporters like those guys over there on the right. So go and read about that. I don't have the time to capture this properly. So before I end, I mean, I wanted to uh, talk about some of the road ahead. And the road ahead is, uh, you know, what some people call Web 3.0. And I like the phrase Web of Value. It's a phrase that appeals to me. So in addition to, uh, I don't know, say things like social networking and responsive design, which are all wonderful, chances are we'll have some form or some forms of micropayments, or payments, if you will, existing on the web. And I wanted to give you a glimpse of that as well. So what do we have for that? Well, we have a wallet in the browser. You can put a little bit of money into that. You can store the bad that you earned, that sort of thing. So that's wonderful. That's a fine start. We might support other currencies in that wallet as well as time goes by. But that's just the beginning. And in fact, it's a pretty significant psychological step for most users to understand what this wallet even means. Yeah? So that's one thing. We have MetaMask, I mentioned that before, so basically it allows you to connect to Ethereum dApps, so distributed apps. Uh, that's a nice bridge. We'll see if it stays that way, like in its present state. I'd love to see more dApps that are interesting. I don't think CryptoKitties on Ethereum are particularly interesting. That's just my opinion. I think we should build more exciting apps or dApps. Oh, we have some work around uh, I, um, IPFS, which is interestingly misspelled, uh, interplanetary file system. Yeah. Um, there, is, there, is a, there is an issue there on GitHub, which you can go and work on, because it's exciting and you believe in the dominance of IPFS, because after all, it's interplanetary, right? I mean, come on, it's right in the name. 
So these are some of the building blocks. I think there'll be many more coming down the pipe. I think this is just the beginning of us kind of building gateways and bridges towards some of the things we'll see uh, coming out in the next couple of years. So I wanted to maybe leave you with this vision, which I think is maybe because I, uh, because I think I'm being kicked out of here as well. Uh, but like, yeah, Twitter, yeah? You use this website, yeah, you've heard of Twitter, great. Okay, so now imagine Twitter monetize. So imagine for a second that instead of just this website here, every time you like a tweet, there's a tiny micropayment that's directed to whomever wrote it. Every time you retweet somebody's uh, comment or whatever, there's a tiny micro payment as well. Every time you comment positively or negatively, there is a micro payment there as well. This is a way to capture attention in the form of cryptocurrency. This is a way to make something that's quite intangible, fairly tangible, or at least virtual. So somebody who is popular on Twitter, like, like who, who do we know? I don't know, Kim Kardashian, uh, the president of a country somewhere there, far away, uh, things like that. So they'll be able to actually take that and, you know, take it, to the, take it to the store, if you will, take it to the shop. That's kind of exciting. So stuff here, great, okay. So building blocks, I cover that. Stack overflow, okay, no time for that. Other exciting examples, no time for that either. Yes, so we have an office in San Francisco. We also have an office in London and Shoreditch. So if you have friends or relatives who are looking for work, um, you know, have them come and talk to me. That's it. I'm being kicked out, so thanks. No, I'm not being kicked out.